YouTube, what's good? It's your boy Ari. Welcome back. Today we're gonna to be reacting to the secret behind the Rockefeller's wealth that won't die. I've always heard of the Rockefellers, but god damn, I want to see how these niggas are. Imagine Let's being get three it. times richer than Jeff Bezos, or having so much power that the US government needs to create unique laws just to control your company. During the height of his career, John D. Rockefeller's wealth amounted to 1.5% of the United States total economic output. Correct me if I'm wrong, didn't the United States at one point in history, I don't know, like back in, I think it was World War I or World War II, they had to get a loan from the Rockefellers? Correct me if I'm wrong. That's about $280 billion today. The secret to his vast wealth was his company, Standard Oil. At its height, Standard Oil controlled 90% of the US refineries and pipelines, and this was during a time when the demand for oil was soaring. Typically, for these kinds of wealthy families, on average, around 10% of the family's wealth survives till the third generation. However, the Rockefeller family still remains one of the richest and most powerful in yeah, the world. And yeah. for the most part, their wealth was made legally. But legal doesn't always mean ethical. This is the story of John Rockefeller. Airport. A century before tech and financial giants ruled the world, there was one name that everyone associated with wealth and power, and that was John D. Rockefeller. John was born in 1839 in Richford, New York, and he was just an ordinary boy. The fact that he would become one of America's most influential people was unpredictable because his father, William Avery Rockefeller, was not a great influence. You see, William was a con artist, and later he became a quack doctor which meant that he sold homemade medicine that he concocted himself. But his real life was shrouded in mystery. He wanted to be successful, or at least give the appearance of success. You see, William paid great attention to his appearance, often dressing well to maintain an air of prosperity. And there were even rumors circulating that he was involved in a horse stealing ring. So yeah, a pretty dubious character. So anyway, he moved his family frequently until 1857, when he settled in Cleveland, Ohio. John's father had bought them a comfortable house to live in. The city would become their permanent home and offer young John opportunities that he could never have found in the more established markets in the US East Coast. During his childhood, John D. Rockefeller grew up like any other country boy, living a simple life. He would attend a district school for a few months each year, and the rest of the time he would spend working and playing in a country setting. He was bright, but unassuming. He would steadily do whatever tasks were set before him. He would chop wood, cared for horses, tended the farm, raising chickens and turkey. I mean, all in all, people never gave him a second yeah. thought. He was just ordinary. The only trait that he had that people noticed was that he was rather silent and reserved for a boy his age. Anyway, his first job was quite underwhelming. He I think it was quiet because he was thinking about that money. Dropped out of high school to take a minimum wage job as an assistant bookkeeper that earned him only 50 cents a day. They but thought he had that money. Plan. There was a vision to take him out of a life of modest income. You see, he saved all his money he earned from his job, and then he decided to ask his father for a loan. Now, we already talked about what a dubious character his father was, so I'm sure he had some money tucked away. But the important thing is, with his savings and this loan from his father, John Rockefeller took his first step into the business world in 1859. He started a commodities brokerage firm called Rockefeller & Clark that he launched with his partner. Their firm traded produce and petroleum products. Now this was a very smart move. You see, America's oil industry was just How? To boom. Nah, 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 nah. That's a big, that's a big jump. I'm not just sitting out here saying, hey, when one of my boys sitting out here saying, oh, let's learn how to trade petroleum, petroleum products. Huh? Like, where, how did he, like, what education did he have to see that, oh, this is a growth or this is something that should invest into? Like, what evidence, like, what did he learn or what, what's, what, what made him think, and how much was this loan that he could have started this company? This is some information I need to know personally. Boom. Furthermore, Cleveland's proximity to the Pennsylvania oil fields meant that it had excellent transportation network and quickly made it a hub for petroleum refining. In 1863, Rockefeller and his partners had earned enough capital to open their own refinery. Now at this stage, you might be thinking that Rockefeller and his partners would go on to achieve great success together, making their mark on the world. 
a real-life American feel-good success stories of two country boys rising from humble beginnings. But that's not how our story goes. Even at an early age, John Rockefeller was cutthroat. A mere two years after their business started, Rockefeller kicked out his partner, bought them out, and then he went on to establish a new firm with the chemist called Samuel Andrews. At this stage, he needed even more capital. So he approached the millionaire Stephen Harkness. You see, Harkness invested $100,000 to become a silent partner, but on one condition. And that was that John would have to take Harkness's relative by the name of Henry Flagler as his partner as well. But this turned out to be a pretty wait, good wait, name wait, of Henry from one condition. And that was that John would have to take Harkness's relative by the name of Henry Flagler as his partner as well. Oh, but yeah. this turned out to be a pretty good move. Flagler's organizational abilities and his creative business skills perfectly complemented Rockefeller's careful money management and strategic vision. Finally, a true partnership was built that would pave the way for Rockefeller's vast industrial empire. Now it's 1870. In just a few short years, Rockefeller had become a powerful young man sitting amongst Ohio's elites. How much? But this was not enough for him. He wanted more. At only 31 years of age, Rockefeller incorporated the company that would make him the most inconceivably rich person and in many ways usher in the modern age of oil. You see, the company was called Standard Oil and its tactics were brutal and John ran the company ruthlessly. He had a strategy that would set him apart. You see, unlike his peers, Rockefeller's new company focused on oil refining. He chose this because this part of the industry boasted more stable costs than exploration and drilling. Rockefeller's obsession with cost saving and waste reduction was well known amongst his contemporaries. However, his ambition extended beyond just being efficient. He wanted to dominate. To achieve this, he invested heavily in research and development. He aggressively brought in the brightest minds and put them to work in what felt like iron-fisted engine rooms of his profit machine. Beyond R&D, Standard Oil consolidated labor in-house and expanded aggressively into markets looking for refinery byproducts. He even took on oil sites that others thought were worthless. For example, Rockefeller acquired fields in Ohio known to contain sour oil. Now this oil was considered unusable due to its impurities, but Rockefeller knew that enough money put in the right place can solve any problem. This is where he turned to his well-established research team. They devised a method to remove the impurities, turning what was once waste into massive profit. So this approach, finding value where others saw none, became a hallmark of Rockefeller's rise to the pinnacle of the American. Industry. Now, this wasn't the whole story behind the Rockefeller success, because beyond shrewd tactics, he sought to dominate the market in almost the literal sense. He perfected the monopoly. He rapidly acquired smaller companies to expand his own empire, a strategy that forever sh Okay, I got, I got a question. question. Why, Why in America, right? Help me understand this. Why do people... Let me just say in America. Why is... Like... They're, They're making, making Rockefeller, Rockefeller seem evil, evil. but when they say ruthless, right? Like, what, what did they, he said to me personally, as I believe in both sides of a story, it's like, you haven't said to me what he did that was ruthless. Yes, he was cutting, he was cutting costs, and he was a penny pinch, penny pincher. So is just about any goddamn CEO, especially in this day and age. So, what did he do that was considered? ruthless in the beginning of the documentary you said that he made his money legally and he oh he wanted more power so every fucking billionaire wants more power every successful not even billion every successful millionaire wants more power you know so it's just confusing me what is did he do to be considered the word ruthless no, I would like that to be explained more. So hopefully they get into the rest of the video. Shaped the future of American capitalism. In just the first three months of 1872, Rockefeller either bought out, shut down, or bankrupted 22 of his 26 Cleveland rivals. He was merciless in his approach. He offered what he claimed were fair market prices to struggling refineries. But in truth, the fact was that Standard Oil's underhanded tactics was driving them to bankruptcy. Why are you say ruthless? They're the fucking competition. You even say competition. I don't know if it's just me, but if I have a product, right, and I can undercut my competition, 
I'm gonna do it. Or if I'm bad, yeah, you say, oh, I'll buy the competition. He didn't do. He, he, it didn't like he signed. He didn't send four big buff niggas with, with machetes and baseball bat. Sign your company over. He offered him a price. Obviously, they loved the price and they said yes. And they they sold their companies to him. And anything other than that, no. Or anything that I understand. But if that's the case, so what's the big problem? Standard Oil's sheer scale gave Rockefeller an unprecedented advantage. He negotiated exclusive railroad discounts by guaranteeing a massive shipment of 60 carloads of oil daily. These deals drastically cut his transportation costs. His rivals simply could not compete with him on such favorable terms. And things would have gotten even worse. Rockefeller's influence stretched even further when he backed the Southern Improvement Company. It was an open plan to fix transportation costs, yet the public was not in his favor. Public outrage quickly shut down the proposal. Despite his ability to sway politicians, Rockefeller learned that even the mightiest tycoon couldn't overpower the strength of a united public. And the public did not like him at all. His oil empire was infamous. He was often likened to an octopus with tentacles gripping not just the oil industry, but also steel, copper, shipping, state houses, and even reaching the highest offices of the US government. But even though he didn't have the public's favor, he was still dominating. By the late 1880s, Standard Oil's dominance was virtually complete. Standard Oil dominated 90% of American refineries. However, what John didn't recognize at the time was that his time in the sun was limited. This overwhelming monopoly, coupled with a scandal involving the Southern Improvement Company, put intense pressure on politicians. Facing re-election threats, they began finally passing antitrust laws and outlawing railroad rebates. It also didn't help that Rockefeller had a strict policy policy of avoiding the press, something that encouraged journalists to investigate Standard Oil even more deeply and exposing its underhanded tactics to the larger public. The public scrutiny and legal challenges continued to intensify. In 1911, the Supreme Court ruled that Standard Oil had violated the Sherman Antitrust Act. It led to the breakup of the company into 34 independent entities. Eventually, Rockefeller had to retire from daily operations at the age of 56, although he remained the figurehead as the president of the company. Now, ironically, this breakup was a blessing in disguise for Rockefeller. The intense pressure of running such a vast empire had taken a toll on his health. I mean, just picture a normal person in their mid-50s and then compare it to how people described Rockefeller at that time. In her expose, journalist Ida Tarbell described Rockefeller as one of the saddest objects in the world. She noted how his alopecia had left him entirely hairless and pale. She could not help but remark that his physical changed seemed to symbolize his perceived wrongdoings. Now, this is where I need to do some speculations. His ruthless way of managing his businesses, the way he put many people out of jobs, the way he brutally destroyed anything in his path. Okay, now when you say put people out of jobs, but if he purchased a company, oh, well, he don't have to keep the employees. Okay, okay. Well, if he, uh, I'm just assuming that when he made these purchases, when he purchased these companies, Kept the employees, but that's my fault for assuming that. Okay. But I get it. Oh, he had a monopoly. Okay, so he determined what was the cost of what. Yada, yada, yada. Okay, cool. Okay, so the U.S. government made him dismantle his, his big monopoly, his big freaking, his powerhouse of a company to 36 different companies. Okay, cool. to build his business, all of that played a okay, role in his diminishing now. health. But I think this is also a turning point because at this juncture, we notice a change in his mindset as well. You see, now he started to focus on something profoundly different, and that was charity. This shift marked the beginning of the Rockefeller Foundation, which would become the cornerstone of John yes. Rockefeller's legacy. Ooh, I, I found the trick. Sure. You got, got me ruthless, but no, well, also really shit though. My opinion. I feel like, because this nigga was a billionaire, for sure. I feel like in order for you to get to a billionaire status, you got to be a ruthless, cold-hearted, cutthroat, conniving, bottom feeder, fucking individual. I don't think, that, I, I don't know. Unless you're a trust fund, baby. But if, you, if you're, if you're self-made... I don't think that you can become a billionaire without doing these things. Because, yeah, I still got to a fucking billion dollars. 
Now, so, so I thought, I thought once, once you get, get to that billion, then you become. <laughs> then you, then you came back to the rest of the world. world. It's like I you just, just how to say, it's like a bulldozer, and, and you just tear on everything. You make, get out of my way! Get out of my way! Get out of my way! Right, you tear on everything. And then after you reach the success, like ah, I can breathe. And you turn back around. Oh shit! I did all of that. Let me let me let me throw some seeds. Yeah, that's how I see that. Established in 1913 by John D. Rockefeller and his family, this marked a transformative shift in his business empire to philanthropy. The foundation was built on a substantial endowment and focused on three main areas, public health, education, and scientific research. Rockefeller's commitment to public health was especially profound. His financial support helped establish the University of Chicago and the Rockefeller Institute of Medical Research. Both of these would go on to become a pioneer in biomedical research. This funding also played a crucial part in developing vaccines for diseases such as meningitis and yellow fever. Additionally, he revolutionized medical training in the United States and founded China's first modern medical school. Now, growing up in Damn. the poorer parts, this Rockefeller is was China? a champion for better public sanitation and health education. He established public health schools at Johns Hopkins better public sanitation. None of these bitches, bitches get on gloves. No and health education. He established public health schools at Johns Hopkins University in 1918 and Harvard University in 1921. He also helped to launch nationwide campaigns and global health campaigns as well. These campaigns targeted diseases such as hookworm, malaria, yellow fever, and typhus. This commitment to solving widespread health issues set the stage for a more strategic approach for the Rockefeller Foundation. Instead of making numerous small donations, Rockefeller preferred to make substantial contributions to institutions with significant potential. He believed in addressing root causes and seeking lasting solutions. Soon enough, the potential on impactful and sustainable solutions extended well beyond immediate health needs. The Rockefeller Foundation was a key funder of the Green Revolution. It drastically increased agricultural productivity in the developing world and is credited to saving up to 1 billion lives. For many years, the foundation continued to distribute more foreign aid than the entire US government. In fact, so much of his wealth was given away that he could only pass a fraction of it to his descendants. In 1912, Rockefeller's fortune was nearly $900 million in that year's dollar value. But upon his death, the estate amounted to only $26 million. This shows his dedication to philanthropy. $900 million in 19, 1912? What was it? Yeah, that was it. Fortune was nearly $900 million in that year's dollar value. But Rockefeller's given away that he could... 1912, $900 million. God damn, you can get a Coke Claire, a Coca Cola for a buck, not even a buck, 25 cents. Shit me. You know what you used to have all night? You used to have 900 million US dollars in 1912? Fuck. 12, Rockefeller's fortune was nearly $900 million in that year's dollar value. But upon his death, the estate amounted to only $26 million. This shows his dedication to philanthropy. Now, having said all of this, all the contributions and benefits to society, were they really done out of goodwill and... A you think that nigga really gave away... How much was that? Uh, $874 million? Look at me. Look at me. No. I think I do that shit. Good heart? I think there's probably a bit more of a complex answer to that. There are several reasons one could do this. Tax write-offs, polishing a dark part of history, building a legacy that's beyond monetary value, and so on. One can never really examine the minds of these historical figures. All we can do is speculate based on the evidence. But, at the end of the day, one cannot deny the benefits that came from the Rockefeller Foundation. Even more than a century later, the Rockefeller family still remains a powerful presence. According to Forbes, be later, the Rockefeller family still remains... Tell, Tell me what y'all see in this. Tell me what you see. Tell me what y'all see. I'll fucking drop a nigga in this family. Ooh, they want to keep that money pure. They don't want no dirty niggas studying their money. God damn! Not a goddamn. <laughs> well, the closest thing to, to to melanin is this woman T. Other than that, not a triple black in this picture. God damn! And they even like, they even just white. They pale white. 
But that's, that's Rockefeller. Rockefeller, the Rockefeller family, family ain't trying to get up that damn. The Rockefellers ain't trying to give a penny to them niggas. Woo! They say, say, Daddy! Call radio. Daddy, I love you! Get that nigga out of my house. I hate you, Daddy! I want to be with you! Tyrone, I'll pay you a million dollars to stop talking to my daughter. <laughs> you ain't have money, boy. I love him because, you know, I was just kidding. A little sense of humor. Means a powerful presence. According to Forbes, they hold a combined net worth of $10.3 billion. I don't believe that. Although some speculate that their wealth could be even higher, we'll just deal with the information that's currently publicly available. Not only this, the wealth could be higher, what we'll just deal with the information. Ariana! You like fat boys? You like fat black boys? Your granddaddy, your great 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 happy in life no more. Come on, man, let me come outside. Let me, you know. Why let y'all know right now, boy? I rather give you one. But I rather give you one shot. I bring you one time. <laughs> I secure my bag. The fuck you think this is? I give back for all the people that couldn't get inside. Information that's currently publicly available. Not only this, the family continued to produce several millionaires and even billionaires. Amongst the most prominent of the Rockefeller descendants in the 21st century was David Rockefeller. At 101 years old, this was the world's oldest billionaire. When he passed away in 2017, his net worth was about $3.3 billion. And in the oil industry, their influence also remains noticeable. Yeah, Standard Oil did break up into multiple companies due to antitrust rulings. However, many of today's major oil corporations, including BP, Exxon, ConocoPhillips, and Chevron, all trace their roots back to Standard Oil. It was only in 2016 that the family fully divested itself from the oil markets, selling all its investments in fossil fuel companies. They claimed that it was because of ethical reasons. Now, the most important question is, what's the secret to their lasting wealth? The answer lies in their strategic approach to wealth preservation. You see, the secret to their lasting wealth had to do with the Rockefellers exploiting legal loopholes to ensure their vast fortune endures through generations. Okay, back to so, okay, exploiting legal loopholes. Isn't that what, you know what I mean? I don't know. Generations, the Rockefellers pioneered a concept of the family office. This is a full service entity managing all aspects of the family's wealth, investments, and business dealings and central to their wealth management strategy are irrevocable trusts. These trusts cannot be easily altered by their heirs. They serve to protect assets from taxes, yep. lawsuits, and creditors. Additionally, the Rockefellers employ what is called a waterfall concept. It is a wealth transfer strategy utilizing permanent tax-exempt cash value life insurance policies. It's a mouthful, but to put it simply, it indefinitely- Every time somebody in the family dies, okay. I'm going to explain to you in the, in the dummy version of me how I understand. Because I was thinking the same thing. So, okay, everybody inside the family has life insurance. And once one person inside the, inside the family dies, they put that money... Okay, the let, okay hold on, let me say it right. So once that person dies of the family, they take that money and they put it back into the family account. And obviously a high, high, high earned interest account. My God, man, this ain't working for me. And they do that with everybody. Remember, you see how the kids, I mean, the first Rockefeller had. So imagine all of those descendants. Remember, this, this, they about probably being like 200, 300 years, no, not 300, but 200 years old at this point. So all those family, they put life insurance on all those people. The pot just getting growing. What, what some of them probably do is like, say they'll, they'll, they would go to school out of that, out of the trust fund, the trust fund account. You would go to school, and that's what give you a good head start. Or if you want to start a company, which probably might, you can get a loan from that account and obviously pay that back with no interest, and you just start your company from there. So it's beautiful. You can get a loan that you don't obviously have to pay it back, but it's not no. It's literally at no interest. Or it depends on how they have it set. He postpones taxes on the transfer of wealth from one generation to the next. Let's take an example. Let's say that your grandparents take out a life insurance policy on each of their grandchildren. 
Now, as long as the grandparents own these policies, they can use these funds as they wish. Upon their death, the ownership of these policies is transferred to the grandchildren who can benefit from the income and designate beneficiaries for future transfers. And again, what has been described is information publicly available. There could be various other measures not known to ordinary people. Look, look, look at all, all these motherfuckers. Half of them probably done if half of them are really this little nigga, nigga probably done there. You get what I'm saying? People that the rich use to reduce their tax liability or even part of their wealth. But it isn't just their wealth that has been long lasting. Their influence into the realm of US politics is mind boggling. In fact, in 2014, it marked the first time since 1950 that Rockefeller was not occupying a high political office. Multiple members of the family had served in prominent political roles, including senators and governors over the decades. What is more, several high profile politicians themselves have married into the family. Also, it's no surprise that the Rockefeller Foundation has been used as a political tool. Initially aimed at supporting global health and educational reforms, the foundation's work has sometimes shifted towards America's foreign policy. For instance, in post-war France, the Rockefeller Foundation's involvement helped counteract communism. It played a role in influencing French economic and educational policies. This ensured France remained firmly in the sphere of America's influence. Now today, global policies continue to be shaped by the Rockefeller Foundation, alongside other major philanthropic organizations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Their initiatives range from health and agriculture to international partnerships. However, this often aligns with market-based interests. You see, through strategic positioning and substantial investments in global health and economic policies, the Rockefeller family maintains its formidable presence, shaping both the domestic and international policies and platforms. It's no surprise that critics argue that these kinds of efforts often undermine international organizations such as the UN. They cited that these foundations shift the focus towards profit-centered solutions corrupting global development strategies. And some might even say that their approach is borderline predatory. They've been accused of placing their employees in international organizations, and this is so that they can gain privileged access to scientific, business, and political elites. This strategy has led to a proliferation of global partnerships, particularly in the health sector. Critics say that these initiatives may sabotage public health development efforts for the sake of increasing their own influence in the process. So yeah, like I was saying earlier, philanthropy and seemingly generous acts can often come from a place of self-preservation and politics. Having said that, it cannot be denied that no matter what their motivations were, there were a lot of beneficiaries from these philanthropic acts. John D. Rockefeller was a master at navigating the system, ruthlessly capitalizing on every opportunity within the rules. And when Man, I don't like that word, ruthlessly capitalizing on every... You know, that's, that's just a fucking contradictory thing to say. Ruthlessly capitalizing on, op on every opportunity that was presented to him. Capitalizing on every opportunity that was... Pre was he not supposed to? When those rules no longer suited his ambitions, he wasn't afraid to influence their change. His philanthropy reshaped education, okay. science, and public health, leaving a lasting positive impact. However, we must take his legacy with a grain of salt, recognizing that there were moral compromises behind his wealth. While John Rockefeller's contributions undeniably improved many lives, they were often built on a back of a system that he manipulated to his own advantage. A complex figure who defined both the darker and the brighter sides of American capitalism. Now, if you stuck till the end, I want you to leave a dollar sign in the comments. Also, please do. I tell you, when they ask me to donate, because I was over the same. My last name is Rockefeller. I got it. But if you guys enjoyed the video, subscribe, comment down below, let me know what you want to see, and I'm out. Till the next one. Peace.